Did you know the best seeds for your garden don't come from the nursery? In fact, the seeds that will create the most robust and delicious fruits and vegetables come directly from your garden. This is because they are uniquely adapted to your growing conditions, better than anything you can buy from a fancy catalog or website. Through the magic of seed saving, it is quite possible to have the garden of your dreams. The best part is, saving your own seeds is surprisingly easy and fun. With a bit of instruction, anyone can become a seed saving superstar. Let us teach you how in our free seed saving webinar. Just text SEEDS to 33444 to sign up or visit SeedSavingHacked.org for more information. That's SEEDS to 33444 or visit SeedSavingHacked.org. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Ira Wallace of Southern Exposure Seed Exchange to talk about seed saving and more. Ira Wallace is an owner of the Cooperative Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, an organization that helps people keep control of their food supply through seed saving and sustainable gardening. Ira is also a co-organizer of the Heritage Harvest Festival at Monticello, a fun, family-friendly event featuring an old-time seed swap local food, and hands-on workshops and demos. Her book, The Timber Press Guide to Vegetable Gardening in the Southeast, is available online and at bookstores everywhere. Welcome to the show today, Ira. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. I really am excited to share about Southern Exposure Sheet Exchange and the work we're doing here in the Southeast to make a more resilient uh, seed network for Mm. everyone. Nice. We're going to talk about that. in in a little while. So I just shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path that you took to where you are now? Well, it started a lot with my grandmother. We grew up, I grew up in Florida in the 60s, and uh, we had what now would be called an edible landscape. Quarter acre, a lot of the edge of Tampa. And we had pecans and avocados and a vegetable garden that was shaded to the south. And I didn't know how important it was until I started gardening on my own, of course, when you're in Florida, that is. Right. Uh, and, you know, when she died the year I went to college, and I missed her so much that uh, I got involved with a group of students and we started the first uh, student garden at our college, New College in Sarasota. And shortly afterwards, I had learned about food co-ops and organics, and boy, I was off and running. Well, I'll bet that was you start. So you started early in the in the yeah. scope of this kind of work in our culture, because that was what early seventies. Yes, it was in seventy. I started the co-op in sixty-eight, and uh, we built it up into the seventies. So you started the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange Co-op in 1968. No, no, this was just my first co-op. Ah. Uh, Southern Exposure, we didn't start until the 80s. And actually, uh, another fellow, Jeff McCormick, uh, started Southern Exposure. And our co-op, we grew seeds for him <laughs> You know, the same as many farms do for us now. Mm-hmm. But the co-op in 1999 took over the stewardship of the project. And uh, we've done well at growing it and bringing in more farms and cooperating with other sustainable agriculture groups in the years that we have uh, had some exposure here at Iowa Farm in Mineral, Virginia. So... I think it's very interesting because we chatted a little bit before we started this and your project doesn't sound very little to me and you just use the word little. So tell us about the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange because it sounds like a, quite an extraordinary project. 
Well, Southern Exposure runs a, a small mail order seed catalog. And honestly, I didn't know, you know, it's kind of like I grew up poor and I didn't know it until I was an adult. Uh-huh. Well, that's how our co-op is little. We have 30 members of the uh, cooperative community here in Mineral, and we do all the administrative, uh, the trials, uh, germination testing, we make the catalog, we do all those things. We have 50 to 70 farms each year who produce seed, because you can't just grow every corn seed next to each other, or they'll be all mixed up. Right. We want that. Yes, exactly. So we work with we work with those farms, and we work with other uh, seed companies on cooperatively. Sometimes having the same farmer grow, um, you know, a certain corn or something, and so that's you know how we are. And we're pretty you know big in in our little regional niche, but when we look at seed companies, they're very tiny. You know, they're you know great big. Uh, well, we kind of joke. Monsanto is our arch nemesis, and they're huge yeah. all around the world. Yeah, exactly. But what we hope is someday there are going to be lots of ants like us <laughs> having independent seed companies, and we're going to just be able to pull that thing down. And we do it not just by selling seeds, uh-huh. but by giving people information so that they can be independent in their gardening and in being able to save seeds. We actually are incorporated in the same statue that the Shakers, who uh, were the first uh, cooperative group that packed seeds in the United States. Uh, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> Which kind of, we didn't realize it until, you know, someone else told us and we were like, whoa, isn't that cool? Yeah. That mission continued. So uh, another part of being a co-op is that we really like working with, you know, other organizations uh-huh. uh, that have similar goals. And so we work, you know, with the Virginia uh, Association for Biological Farming. Uh, with the National Seed Savers Exchange, uh, you know, with Georgia Organics, all these kinds of groups. This year, we're going to do a really fun thing. Is we're going to have a one-day intensive seed school as a pre-conference thing for the Virginia uh, Association of Biological Farming Conference. Oh, and nice. That's gonna get, yeah, you're going to learn how to save seeds, how to store them, and how to raise a little cane helping to make more independent uh, seeds which is available in your own neighborhood, whether that be just growing yourself or starting a seed library or making a, a co-op so that people can buy the, their seeds together and save money. All those things that you can do. Right. You don't have to feel like helpless in the face of big multinationals. Right, exactly. So you used a word earlier, and it kind of ties into the same conversation, resilient. Ah, yes. Please say say more about that. (laughs) Well, resilient to me is tied up to what earlier in my life was like homesteading. To try to make your life be more simple, Mm -hmm. uh, where you need less things, where more of the things that you have are a matter of choice. To have a gardening system that is able to um, deal with variations in climate. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going on with the climate, but if you build up your soil, if you make, you know, paths that are filled with um, sawdust or some material that will hold water Mm -hmm. when you have excessive moisture at one time uh, and have it available for the roots to put down. If you grow a variety of crops, not just one or two, then you are in a position to withstand unexpected changes in the future. Mm. And in the meantime, you get to have really delicious stuff to eat. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Isn't that we nice? Love it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at your, your website, southernexposure.com, uh, and there are hundreds and hundreds of different varieties of seeds here, yes? 
Absolutely. And all of them have been trialed at our farm here in uh, Mineral, Virginia. We offer things that we know will do well Mm -hmm. uh, in our climate, or if there are things that are more challenging, like Brussels sprouts. The truth is, you know, to have Brussels sprouts in the southeast, like Virginia and further south, timing and variety are of the essence. Yeah. So they're easy if you get the timing just right. And what we try to provide is that information about timing as well as variety that will work there. But it still isn't as easy to grow as cabbage. <laughs> right. We're not going to tell you that tall tale. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. That's um, a fun thing that I like doing is going around and doing workshops and introducing people to how to garden year round. I mean, in the Southeast, Mm -hmm. uh, you have a great opportunity. The winters are not too harsh. The summers are hot, but they have adequate moisture so that uh, you're able to have something growing fresh out of the garden every month of the year if you pick the right varieties and plant them at the right time. And a few years ago, like five years ago, I had the opportunity to write a book, and it was a funny time in my life, Mm -hmm. because a brain tumor, and I had to have it removed, and I thought, oh, what a thing to do when I'm recovering. If things go well, I'll have a book. I can go around and promote it. If things Uh don't go so well, I will have downloaded my experience. Well, things went well, fortunately. and in the meantime, I have a book that many people have uh, really enjoyed in the uh, in the southeast and find it helps them to be able to figure out how to have not necessarily something growing. I'm not going to say that things are going to grow that much in December and January, but if you have them planted and they're alive and well mulched or covered with grow cover, they will be able to be harvested throughout the darkest days of yes. winter. And you'll have small plants that will start to grow again in the spring so you can have stuff early to carry you through that hunger gap uh, in late March and April. I like that you said hun- hunger gap. That's an interesting term and it makes perfect sense. We don't use it so much now because we have grocery stores. But if we're trying to eat through the year from our garden, that is a really challenging time to have fresh. Yeah. Yeah, that is the case. We're lucky enough down here in the Southwest that um, we also can grow through the winter. And that's I use that same strategy here at the Urban Farm where we plant all kinds of stuff out in the fall and it just kind of slows down in December and January. And as soon as it warms up a little bit, it just explodes with life, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I love that time of year. Yeah. It's uh, really nice. I also love going out on a chilly day and uh, moving my row cover and having all these vibrant green. Mm-hmm. But harvested from our outdoor living refrigerator <laughs> that, oh man another great term another great term you're just coming up with all kinds of them today this I'm is a- my topic <laughs> oh good good so I'm still on your website this is a fascinating website again that's southernexposure.com um, and I navigated through to the broccoli and you have 12 varieties of broccoli that is um, I'm sure there's more of them out there, um, but oh. that's amazing to me that you would have 12 varieties. Well, you know, I only eat one kind of broccoli. Why would I need 12 different varieties? Well, it you know depends. Some broccolis do better, uh, you know, in the spring, like the sprouting and very early ones, at least in our part of the mm-hmm. country. Whereas other things like Waltham or Thompson, these older varieties. They mature more slowly, but they can take the cool weather in late fall better. Ah. So that's the broccoli you're going to have like at Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. So it just it depends, you know, what you're looking for. Uh, and we like to give people choices because some things do, you know, some of them uh, do better if you have a sandy soil. Mm-hmm. Others do better in a heavy clay soil. So you, right. you sort of... We go through and we try to give you some of that information uh, in the catalog so that you can make a choice to your location. Perfect. And I just, I can't even believe this. You have over 
tom on tomatoes, it's where to go. 204 different varieties of tomatoes. That's uh, amazing. There are so many tomatoes. You know, tomato is the number one uh, variety grown in gardens throughout the U.S. Yep. So there's a tomato for every uh, condition. And people like different kinds of tomatoes. Someone yeah. likes it so juicy that it drips down your, to your elbow. Mm -hmm. Other people like them firm and dry so that they can make a quick tomato sauce. We try to give you all those choices wow. and then some that you never knew about. <laughs> and you, yeah, exactly. And when you mostly have them on your website as by color. Well, color and yeah. size. There's purple and black and yellow and orange and green and bicolor and cherry and currant and wow, y'all y'all need to check out this page. This is amazing. It's yeah. absolutely amazing. Yeah. And then on the front page of your website is this absolutely extraordinarily beautiful catalog, seed catalog. But this isn't yeah. your normal seed catalog. This is like one of those coffee table pieces. Can you tell us about it? Well, uh, you know, our catalog, it, we call it our catalog and gardening guide. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I said we're co-op, and so there are a number of us, and we contribute uh, a photograph and uh, also the artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, we have the members who live here on the farm, and then we have our extended network of uh, farms that produce seed, and we all make that. Uh, catalog and we try to have it be fun mm -hmm. as well as informative uh, and we have we literally have people who have asked us if they can blow up covers and put them yeah. on the wall in their kitchen I, it's so fun right I see it this is this is artwork in itself I mean you are hand drawing the pictures the cover and the pictures of the vegetables and it's all over your website yes Yes, it is. Yeah, one of our uh, Jesse Doyle is one of our um, prolific artists, and she has some of her artwork on Etsy. If people like the style of it, uh, they might get to see more stuff that she uh -huh. done. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful catalog. So. Tell me a little bit about your book. And you told me how it came to be. It's called the Timber Press Guide to Vegetable Gardening in the Southwest. Can you tell us about your book? Southwest. I know you're in the Southwest, but I uh, am in the Southeast. <laughs> and I, Slap my hand. I, and, 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 yes. <laughs> but, uh, and that's one of the things that distinguishes my book uh -huh. is that it is, it is a month-by-month -month guide that tells gardeners in the Southeast when to plant, uh, what maintenance has need to be done, just kind of a reminder of what you need for each month and nice. what should be available to harvest if you had planted it. Uh, and it's it's great that way. And then we have another section, the first section, which is kind of about the region and what you can expect in the weather and oh, yes. uh, an overview right. you know, of planning and that. And then we end up with uh, something about each individual type of vegetable page about that so you can learn the general things about dealing with uh, tomatoes. And we have a couple of uh, planting calendars that you can get an overview of what you might do if mm -hmm. you live in the upper south, as I call it, like Virginia and the state um, that are across Kentucky in that part, yeah. or the lower south, which is more the coastal region in right. Mississippi, Alabama. It gives you an idea of how to get going, and I've had even experienced gardeners say they learned a few tricks that they hadn't tried. So Nice. Um, that's you always get it nice. At, the, at most library, at many libraries, because it was uh, when it came out, it was uh, in our region recommended as a, a reference book by the library journal. So. Perfect. Perfect. So I'm going to I'm going to shift a little bit here on you and I, I want to know about a time you failed in gardening and how you may have overcome that and what you learned. Well, the first time I had a garden here in Virginia was um, I sort of lived a lot of different places mm -hmm. and I had been in North Carolina, but I'd been living in Canada for four years and 
my goodness, I came and I'm going to do this fall garden, and I waited too late. Oh, yes. You know, to uh, at the time that I was planting them, I just didn't exactly realize that it, it's not as much difference in time about when you would plant here as it was from Canada because you have this fall effect. Right. You, you plant stuff and there's, you know, a lot of daylight and a lot of sunlight, but after you get into September, the amount of daylight quickly, quickly goes down. And so each week before the middle of September is like two or three weeks after. So I got off my high horse and uh, did a little research and did a lot better than that. <laughs> yeah. You know, most areas have planting calendars that you can plug into. So that's what I just suggest. I suggest that especially if you're new to an area, go go find the planting calendar for the area. And you can't trust the nurseries. Um, I know here in Phoenix, they will sell you something that does not supposed to grow this time of year. Absolutely. You know, and in many areas now, they have master gardener groups, and they uh, have a lot of information available and usually a help desk to help you out. Yeah. As a matter of fact, speaking of master gardener groups, I a few years back, I thought I was going to semi-retire. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I joined, took the master gardener class so that I could be a volunteer, you know? I thought, oh, oh, yes, I, yes, of course. I'll, I'll find all these things out. And for my project, I um, started the Heritage Harvest Festival at Monticello. Wow. Uh, okay, Master Gardener friends, we Southern Exposure and the local Master Gardeners and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, we put on what we thought was going to be a small event <laughs> at the nursery area of uh Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. It's called the Center of Historic Plants. And we opened up the gate, and over that first day, a thousand people showed up. Wow. Surprised. And uh, since then, that was 10 years ago. Uh-huh. And since then, now we're up to having up to 6,000 people come to the festival. And it's moved up to, rather than at the nursery now, it's on Mr. Jefferson's front lawn at Monticello. Mm-hmm. Nice. Nice, nice. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the next question. It kind of touches on this might be it. What do you consider your biggest success? It is one of, yeah. I would say it sort of goes between the educational materials for seed savers uh, that we worked on a Saving Our Seed project and have all these uh, materials online for uh, seed savers. Mm-hmm. But I think actually the Heritage Harvest Festival uh, is a little bit more spectacular. <laughs> wow. I like that you use the word spectacular. That's spectacular. That is so cool. So what drives you? Gosh, you know, I grew up during the civil rights days mm-hmm. in, in Tampa. And my grandma, who raised me, said to me at that time when we were marching and she was having me go around and sign up, you know, neighbors to get a ride to vote. And she says, it probably won't make a difference if we do this. But I am absolutely certain that if we do not try, nothing will change. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I grew up, I kind of food and access to good food uh, is my issue and I feel yeah. like maybe the issue of many people of my uh, generation and so you know what drives me is knowing that if I don't try most certainly things will not change so why not try hard that's absolutely beautiful that's Spectacular. Thank you. So I'm all about education, and I have to know, is there one book that's been influential for you in this seed process? Well, yes, there is. Uh, There's a book called Seed to Seed uh, by Suzanne Ashworth, Mm -hmm. and it's actually uh, published by uh, Seed Theorists Exchange. And this book was the first one to really look at seed saving as sort of 
that's something an everyday person could do. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what's been done for most of history, mm. is that farmers and gardeners save seeds. But for about 50 years, we got confused. <laughs> and that book just popped right out, and that plus the Teetavers Exchange movement made me realize I can do this. And not only me, but anybody in their own yard, on their farm, mm-hmm. and let's do things that help make it possible for people to do it. So Seed to Seed is one. There's a new one out from Seed Tavers Exchange called a Seed Garden, which even expands more on mm-hmm. that topic of saving your own seeds and uh, sharing them. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. So, I hear you're going to be speaking at Marjorie Wildcraft's Homegrown Food Summit in March. Uh, yeah, I am. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which Please. is garlic and perennial onions. Uh, nice. So, yeah, you can get, you know, there's so many garlics, and one for every uh, situation, so many flavors. And you know what's nice about it? It's one of those things that you plant in the fall Uh and you get to harvest it, you know, in the early summer. So you miss a lot of months of weeding. (laughs) Fantastic. Well, I will see you at that summit because I'll also be doing a a, uh, lecture on Jumpstart Your Urban Farm. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I'm so glad I was invited. Yeah. Great company to be in. Yes, absolutely. So what final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Well, grow your own food. You know, we get so much freedom and resilience in our system. The more people who are growing food year-round and they're just depending uh, on these grocery stores and stuff, yeah. and take action to make it a better food system great so thank you so much for joining us on the show today and sharing your experience Ira it's been great chatting with you around seed saving so how can our listeners get a hold of you well they can visit uh, our website southernexposure.com mm-hmm. if they're interested in coming to our Heritage Harvest Festival they can visit uh, that website heritageharvestfestival.com and I even have a little one for myself which is Ira Wallace uh, no it's just a Facebook page Ira Wallace author and that's where you can find out where I'm going all around and maybe I'll come near you perfect you Perfect, perfect. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Did you know the best seeds for your garden don't come from the nursery? In fact, the seeds that will create the most robust and delicious fruits and vegetables come directly from your garden. This is because they are uniquely adapted to your growing conditions better than anything you can buy from a fancy catalog or website. Through the magic of seed saving, it is quite possible to have the garden of your dreams. The best part is, saving your own seeds is surprisingly easy and fun. With a bit of instruction, anyone can become a seed saving superstar. Let us teach you how in our free seed saving webinar. Just text SEEDS to 33444 to sign up or visit seedsavinghacked.org for more information. That's seeds to 33444 or visit seedsavinghacked.org. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.